Bach Prelude in C is one of the most popular pieces that students like to play. And it's understandable why, because it's such a beautiful piece. And I have taught this piece hundreds of times, I have heard it performed thousands of times by tons of different people. And there are some very common mistakes that I see, and some techniques that I've implemented in my teaching to ensure that students can learn this piece to the best of their ability. So today, I'm going to share with you five things that you must do when you are learning Bach Prelude in C. Now the first thing I want you to pay attention to when you're learning this piece is fingering. Fingering is essential for any piece of music that you're learning. Fingering is not only essential because it helps you know where you need to be and when you need to be there, but fingering is essential for memory. Every single time we play a piece, we want to be as consistent as possible. And so if we are really specific about our fingering and we write our fingering in the score, we know every time we play exactly which fingers we're using and we're being completely consistent. So you can see on this score that there were some fingering suggestions, the little black numbers that are above the notes. And then I've also kind of written over some of those fingering suggestions with the blue numbers over the notes and those are my fingering suggestions. And it's totally fine if you don't follow the fingering in your music exactly. You are welcome to change things to better suit your hand. Everybody's hands are different. There are some basic fingering principles we should all abide by, but it's fine to change little things as long as you write it in your music and you remain consistent. I've gone through this entire piece and I have written in my fingering suggestions and there's gonna be a free PDF that goes along with this video. It's gonna be on my blog and so I'm gonna link that in the description below. Make sure you check that out and make sure you print out that PDF because it's gonna have all of my notes and all of my practice tips that we're talking about in this video. The fingering for this piece specifically is also very important because this is entire piece is made up of broken chords or of arpeggios. So if we look at every single measure and we take all the notes in the measure and we squish them together and we play them at the same time, or what I call block them, we block them together, they make a chord. And so in this PDF, I've actually included two different chord blocking exercises that you can do to practice this piece, because it's one of the most efficient ways to practice this piece. So the first one that I've included is a really great sheet from practicingthepiano.com. And they took every single measure of this piece and they just wrote out the chords for you. And underneath the chords, you can see the Roman numeral analysis. Now, if you are familiar with music theory and you know what that means, awesome. That's gonna help you even more when you practice this piece. And if not, that's okay. It's not essential that you know what the Roman numerals are in order to benefit from this practice. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna print out this PDF and you're gonna look at these chord blocks and you're just gonna practice the chord blocks with the proper fingering. So instead of playing this piece in its original form, you're gonna practice it like this. Now this way of practicing is going to be hugely helpful for you because one of the most common errors that I see when people are trying to play this piece is that they play the first couple of beats and then they have to take a long pause and then they play another few beats and then they have to take a long pause. And those pauses happen because when we're first learning this piece, we're thinking of every single note individually. And it's really easy to do that because there's a lot of notes in this piece. We want to get our brain to start thinking of these notes of a broken chord as a unit because if we can think of them as a unit, we have a context for what the notes are and our hands can predict how that unit or that chord is gonna feel before we get there. And so it helps us to not think of things as individual notes, but to think of just different hand positions as we move around the chords. So when you practice this chord blocking, it's essential that you use the same fingering that you're gonna use when you play the piece because otherwise it's gonna be a huge waste of time and you might as well not do it. Now I also included another chord blocking worksheet that actually has the letter names of the chords. And if you are familiar with letter names of the chords, like C major, A minor, that kind of stuff, then you can go ahead and use that to your advantage when you practice. And if not, that's okay also. You can still benefit from this chord blocking worksheet as well. And if you wanna learn more about chords so that the letter names do make sense, you can go ahead and check out my video about different chord symbols and what they mean, and I'll link that in the description below. So once we're clear on our fingering, and once we've worked on blocking all of the chords, we're gonna take a look at the rhythm of this piece, and we're gonna make sure that we understand the rhythm and that we can play all of the rhythm consistently. Now, you can see that I went ahead and wrote in the counting for the piece, which is one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. The reason that I'm counting that way is because I'm subdividing every single beat into four equal parts because the piece is written in 16th notes. 
Now the nice thing about this piece is that the rhythm remains completely consistent throughout the whole thing. So if you get really comfortable counting one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a, you're going to be able to do that for the entire piece. I do want you to count out loud when you're practicing this piece. I've seen a lot of people that think because the rhythm is so repetitive that they can just maybe count the first measure and then go on autopilot and let themselves feel the rhythm. But counting is really, really, really important not only to keep a steady rhythm, but also to help us feel things internally and to help us know exactly where and when we're supposed to be in different places with our hands. So counting is important for memory and it's important for the learning process because it helps provide a structure to what we're playing and it also is essentially like we're conducting or giving really clear directions to our hands about when and where to play. So I wrote in the first measure for you and I want you to go ahead and write in the rest of the counting and writing it in is gonna be a really great exercise to help you connect with what the rhythm is and then having it visually on the page after you wrote it in is gonna be a great reminder when you're practicing to actually be counting out loud. All right, the fourth thing that I want you to pay attention to when you're learning this piece is the phrases. And in any piece of music, we're gonna have phrases. And a phrase in music is essentially like a sentence. Music is a language and we are always trying to express things when we're playing music. And just like in the English language, we have different sentences and the sentences have a beginning, a middle and an end. And then we start another sentence that has a beginning, a middle and an end. And the same is true in music. Now you can see the phrases that I've written in this score, they're numbered. So the first phrase has a number one with a circle around it. The second phrase has a number two with a circle around it. The third phrase has a number three with a circle around it. Now phrases aren't always going to be something that's written in stone because different people might have have different artistic opinions about where the phrases are, but I've given you my idea on phrasing for this piece, not only because it's going to help you decide what to do musically, but also because these are great ways to break up your practice. So once we're really clear on where the phrases are in our music, we can practice individual phrases and we can practice them in order, we can practice them out of order, but it really can help to break things down into smaller sections because we already have those sections written in the music. Now, I like to number the phrases with the number and the circle around because I actually also call those memory starts. And memory starts I talk a lot about in my videos about memorization, and you can check those out. I'll link them in the description below. But memory starts are a really great way to get familiar with the form of a piece and the structure of a piece. And we can practice starting out of order with different memory starts, and that's really going to strengthen your memory and your knowledge of this piece. Now, once you're clear on where the phrases are, you can use that to help inform the fifth thing that I want you to do, which is to get really clear on the dynamics that you're doing when you're playing this piece. Now, dynamics are tricky because it's always going to be largely up to your own artistic interpretation and your artistic choices, what you do with dynamics, and different scores are going to have different ideas. So there were already some suggestions written into this score that I was using. I pulled out some other scores and there are different suggestions in those scores. So with dynamics, what I like to do is I like to listen to a couple of recordings and take notes on what I like and what I don't like. And then I also like to look at a couple of different scores. The great thing about this Bach piece is that it is on IMSLP and I'll link that in the description below. And you can look up several different editions of this score and you can see what dynamics they suggest. You'll also occasionally get a score that has no dynamic suggestions, in which case it's kind of like a blank canvas. But here on this score, you can see the suggestions that were originally in the score are written in black in between the treble and bass clef. And then I have lots of crescendos and decrescendos written in green in between the treble clef and bass clef. Similarly to the phrases, the dynamics are just suggestions. They're my artistic interpretation of what I think this piece should be, but I don't want you to get too hung up on the exactness of the crescendos or the decrescendos, because in this piece, I feel like there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of, you know, swelling and then kind of coming back and swelling and coming back. And so my crescendos and decrescendos aren't necessarily representations of, you know, starting exactly piano and getting exactly forte, but they're just kind of suggestions of where those swells should be. Now, if you don't like my dynamics, cross them out and come up with your own and that is totally fine. But just keep in mind that this piece and all music should be really expressive and really dramatic and you are hopefully feeling something as you're playing it and those of us that are listening are hopefully feeling something as we're listening to you play it. So make sure you go to my blog that's linked in the description below and download this PDF so that you can see all of my notes and all of my practice suggestions. And I also give constructive feedback for a couple of different performances and a couple of different masterclass videos. So I'm going to link those in the 
description as well. And if you'd like to see some people performing the Bach Prelude in C and then me giving feedback based on their performances, you can do that in the masterclass videos. Now as a bonus, once you've done all of these five things, I'd like you to watch my video about practice techniques to fix every problem in your piano practice, where I talk about practicing in rhythms and using the post-it note method. And those three tips that I cover in this video are going to be really great next steps for what you're going to do with the Bach Prelude in C once you're clear on fingering, rhythm, once you've done chord blocking, and you know your phrases and you know your dynamics. Now, if you implement all of these things that I'm talking about into your practice, you're going to know this piece really well, and you're going to be very much on your way to playing it and performing it beautifully and musically. So don't go get started on your Bach just yet. Make sure you watch those practice techniques, and you can do that right here. Mm -hmm.